right, good evening, everybody. We're going to go ahead and try to get through chapter 11 uh, this evening. Uh, basically, this one's going to be relatively quick. Um, actually, I like to actually teach you most of this. It's good information. So we're going to go ahead and try to get through this as promptly as we can. We're going to talk about how home ownership is actually helped. Okay, how do we actually end up holding uh, property? in regards to ownership. So what we're ending up doing is, is uh, we're gonna talk about the different ways that title can be held, that a deed can be held. So with that being said, uh, we're going to explain the four basic forms of co-ownership and explain how each is going to be created and terminated. We're also going to describe the ways in which various business organizations may own a property we're also going to state the common business entities uh, in which real estate brokerages are organized. So a real estate brokerage also can be organized through a company. Uh, we'll state the following requirements. We'll also talk about this, uh, the state of the License Act as well as TREC rules that are governing each. And we'll distinguish among cooperative, condominium, and timeshare ownerships. Okay, so when purchasing a property, you can order or you can own it in either ownership in severalty, co-ownership, or trust ownership. Now, Mr. Eugene, what is this word? Take off the T-Y on severalty. What does that say? Several. So how many owners would be in an ownership in severalty? Severalty? One. 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 You think severalty? They trick you on that one. They trick you on that one. So just because it says several in the word, it basically means one. Okay, so ownership in several T means one owner. Okay, so don't let that trick you. Don't let that trick you. Um, co ownership, now how many owners could be in a co ownership? Two. What did you say earlier? Several. Several. They could be as small as two or as many as me. Okay, trust ownership does what? Well, it means that it's being held in trust, okay? So ownership in severalty, like I said, is a sole owner. And it is a it could be a partnership, a corporation, or a limited liability company. Mr. Eugene, you could start an LLC, and all of us in this room could end up being on that LLC, okay? Uh, now, while we all have interest in the business, do we have individual interest in the property? No, who has interest in it? No, the LLC. Oh, the LLC. The LLC has the interest, not you. Nobody that's part of the LLC that are members of it have interest in it in regards to ownership. They may have a, a interest in the property, but they can't go sell the property. So if we're four in an LLC, well, that means I can't go sell the property, you can't, we, unless we give that person the power, we cannot sell that property, okay? So the LLC owns the property, okay? Now, a tenancy in common is one type of co-ownership. So in this particular situation, if you were to look at the previous slide, there's only one owner, and that's the only type in that. Now, with co-ownership, there's different types. So you see right here, there's tenancy in common. There's also going to, if you can flip me over real quick, there's also joint tenancy with right or survivorship. And there's community property. Okay. So as we're going through this, don't think that the only type of co-ownership is tenancy in common. There's multiple types. Okay. So tenancy in common is an un- divided interest, okay? Unity of possession and interest may be unequal. So Mr. Eugene, if we have a co-ownership, you may own 25%, Stefan owns 10%, I own 15%. It's not gonna be equal, okay? So you're gonna be unequal. Interest may be sold, mortgaged, or transferred without the consent of others, and the interest passes to the heirs on death. Okay, so as you can see here, A and B are tenants in common, so they each owe 50-50.
but B dies, and his will, uh, he wills his interest to C and D. So now this little nice chart of A and B now becomes A, C, and D. Okay? So in this particular situation, the interest is then split. Make sense? Okay. Now, a joint tenancy with right of survivorship, it's created by a specific written agreement. All right. It is undivided and equal interest. There are four unities. There's time, title, interest, and possession. The right of survivorship is that the interest passes to the remaining joint tenants, not being wheeled off to somebody else. Okay. And on the sale of one interest, the new party is the tenant in common. So at that point, when the new party comes in, they're not coming in as a joint tenant. They're coming in as a tenant in common, which we just talked about. So this gives you a nice little chart here. Okay. So you have A, B, and C, all joint tenants. A sells her interest to D. Well, D is a tenant in common, while B and C still have joint tenancy. Okay. Now, this provides you an example of the right of survivorship model. So where A, B, and C are joint tenants, then C dies. So A and B remain the joint tenants. When B dies, A gets the entirety in several T, which is then inheritable. So when A dies, D and E get it tenant in common. Makes sense. Okay. Now, community property. Community property is, is that it is a joint effort, effort of a husband and wife, okay? And it includes most income from separate property. If it's homestead, both spouses must sign, and it may be converted from separate property, okay? So in this particular situation, if, Mr. Eugene, you inherit land, and it is put particularly in your name, it is separate property. But the minute that you put your wife on that title, it now becomes community and she has 50% interest. <clears throat> that makes sense, okay? But could you hold things that you inherit separately for the remainder of your life? Yes, you can, okay? So just because you inherit something does not always mean that the other spouse automatically gets 50% interest, okay? Now again, separate property is what we call it's owned prior to the marriage. So before you get married, any of your assets prior to the marriage is yours, unless, unless you combine things. You put that spouse into it, then everything's 50-50, okay? It's acquired by, another way for you to get separate property is if it's acquired by the purchase of separate funds, gift or inheritance, sale of separate property, settlement or judgment for personal injury or contract with the spouse okay sometimes you can say i'm about to get a lump sum of money so i'm going to talk to my spouse and we write up a contract that everything that i'm getting is mine and my spouse doesn't get any okay you could do that now again income however is generally going to be community so if you're working a job yeah, you might, Mr. Eugene, get the paycheck, but because it is done during the marriage, it's classified as community, okay? Again, separate property, homestead, requires, though, that both spouses have to still sign. Even though, Mr. Eugene, you end up in this hypothetical, you own the property, okay, your spouse still has to sign the deed, okay? Still is your separate property, but because it's the homestead, both parties have to sign, okay, both spouses. Now, equitable interest for non-owning spouse. This is the enhancement of the value theory. And what this means is that when you're dealing with these non-owning spouses, this is, say, continuing with that same hypothetical, Mr. Eugene, you inherit land. There is going to be equitable interest for your wife, okay? Because there is going to be using the enhancement of value theory, the contribution of community funds towards the purchase repair of that separate property. So 
if you decide to buy or build a house on that land, you're probably using your income, which is what? Community. To pay the note to build that house. Therefore, there's potential interest that she should be entitled to some of that, that proceeds. So, in that particular situation, use of the community funds to reduce unsecured debt of separate property can also be another way. Now, the contractual separate property is that there can be written contract that's signed by both spouses separating community property. You can go in with a prenuptial agreement, and a prenup does what, Stephen? What's a prenup? Do you remember? Uh, it's, I, they don't take half your stuff. Well, yes. So a prenup basically says what's mine is mine and what's yours is yours. Oh. Okay. So, Mr. Eugene, before you got married, you could said, okay, Miss Linda, uh, what's, what is mine is mine, what's yours and yours, and if I have everything and you have nothing, if we happen to divorce, guess what happens? You get to keep all your stuff and she gets to keep hers. Okay? But again, good luck getting somebody to sign a prenup. Unless they're older and they want their kids to get what they work for. But most of the time, you're not going to find somebody in the young ages to want to voluntarily sign a prenup. Okay. Community property uh, right of survivor. The property can be transferred to the surviving spouse at death. Again, this is very similar to a joint tenancy, but between spouses and each spouse is going to be jointly and severally liable for the community debt. Okay. In regards to the agreement, the agreement in writing and the signed by both parties and probate basically is eliminated by using this right of survivorship. Okay, that's where I was talking about in another class where what ends up happening is, Mr. Eugene, if you do a right of survivorship, Miss Linda may end up in that particular situation. You pass away, she doesn't have to go to court because it's just automatically transferred to her because she's the right of survivor. She's been a beneficiary, okay? Again, the community property upon death, it's gonna be all to the spouse if surviving children are in common to both spouses. So if you don't have stepchildren, all this other stuff, you just have your own children, then it's all gonna to go to the spouse, okay? One half to the spouse and one half to the children if the children are not in common. So if you end up, if you've remarried and you have passed, then that current spouse that you're with gets half and the children get the other half, okay? Uh, community property upon death is that one third is to go to the spouse for life and the balance would be shared equally by their children, okay? Now that basically ends the whole community co-tenant and all. Now we're going into trust ownership. Okay. Now, you have to know these parties, and I'm going to help you understand this. Okay. The parties to a trust ownership, number one, a trust store, is going to be the one that creates the trust. So, for example, Mr. Eugene, you may end up, you may say, you know what, uh, me and Linda want to give, you know, our children who are underage our assets. If we pass... We want our children to get our stuff, but, you know, little Justin, he's only, you know, 10 years old, and little April's eight years old, okay? Um, so if they inherit, say, $100,000, they're going to go spend it all on toys, okay? Or McDonald's, you know? So in that situation is the trust store, you're creating this trust, for the benefit of your children. So, Mr. Eugene, who would then be the trustor? You're the trustor. You and Miss Linda would right. be the trustor, okay? Because you're creating the trust. Who's the beneficiary? The children. So, your children, little Justin, little April, is your beneficiary. They're the one that receives them. Now, are you going to put little Justin or little April as the trustee? Do you think we should manage a trust? Not, not until uh, later in life. Until I'm older, right? Right. So you might call Miss Leela. 
and say, Miss Leela, hey, can you manage the trust? I give you how I want things to be dispersed, but you're going to manage the trust on behalf of my children until they hit a certain age. So Miss Leela would be called the trustee. Okay. So she would hold legal title to any assets. She would be entrusted with carrying out your instructions that you give her, and it is a fiduciary duty. Now, Mr. Grossman, where did you see this word fiduciary before? Uh, you say it all the time. Are, are, are you as a real estate agent, are you a fiduciary? Do you have a fiduciary relationship? I do, I do. You do? That, that's the lowest form, right? No. What is it? It's the highest form. It's the highest form. So in that particular situation is Miss Leela would have to be held to a very high standard. Now, Miss Leela, are you here tonight? Yes. Okay, so Miss Leela, does this mean since you're at a high standard, does this mean that if you happen to just want to go shopping on the, the trust money, can you do that? You know, I was going to ask that. <laughs> Cause you know, it was like, man, this is, this is kind of good being in this trust thing. Yeah. But I'm assuming the correct answer would be no. That's right. Now, now let's, that's, you're right. It would be no. Now, Mr. Eugene, could you put in your instructions? Could you say, Miss Leela, for managing my trust, I give you 2000 a month. Could you do that? Oh yeah. Yeah, you could. You could tell Miss Leela when you're creating this trust, Ms. Leela, I'm going to have $100,000. I want you to not only take care of my children, but I also want you to maintain stuff. And I know this is going to be a job in itself. So you take $2,000 out a month to take care of my children and to take care of my, my assets for my children. You could do that. And Ms. Leela could go shopping on a shopping spree every month. Okay? Amen. So yeah, that's a win-win. But again, a lot of times people don't understand this trustee position isn't easy no it's not. and it's a huge liability yes it is it's a huge liability because if miss leela does not follow things to the instructions to the t of these instructions mm -hmm. what could happen Stephen? she doesn't do what mr eugene said what could what could happen well she could be sued she could be sued and, and in that situation, she could lose her authority as a trustee. And in that particular way, in particular situation, she has to pay back to the trust. See, you got to be very careful in this trustee position. Okay. Because this is a very high liability. Who do you think should be a trustee? Who would be a prime person to be a trustee? A lawyer. Why a lawyer? Well, they know all the laws and everything. <clears throat> they know the They're, laws, they, they know have, the duties, they've got the schooling. Yeah. And also they have probably errors and omissions mm -hmm. and malpractice and all that other type of insurance. Mm -hmm. So if Ms. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. Is this the same concept when people leave money for their pets? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And if you don't take care of the pets, somehow you get sued or something like that? Yes, ma'am. You're right on it. Right okay. on it. This is exactly what it is. So this whole thing is you are managing a person's estate. So if you've ever in your life, you've ever been an executor or an executrix, this is basically what it is. Except the thing is, is that it's not all nice and pretty, or pretty in this situation. What happens is the trustee or trustor is normally the person that died, the beneficiaries who's receiving from the wheel, and the executor or executrix is the trustee. So I tell people this all the time. This trustee position ain't easy. Because you're literally doing everything that that person had to do. So imagine if you hate doing your monthly bills. <clears throat> I know I hate doing my monthly bills. I hate seeing the money going out. None coming in, but all of it going out. 
Well, imagine, guess what happens? You get to do that twice a month instead of once, twice a month. And imagine, Travis, if you had five people that you're the executor on, he gets to do it five times plus his own. Okay. And sometimes this is a unpaid situation. You have to take that. Not from a will standpoint. And oftentimes trust has two to three trustees. So if Travis say, say Mr. Eugene, you were first, and you say, hell no, I ain't dealing with that. Then it designates Steph. And Steph's like, I ain't dealing with that. There ain't no money for it. Why am I going to waste my time? And it goes to Travis, and Travis says, well, nobody else wants to do it, I'll do it. Okay. Well, if, he said no, if he says no, and all of them say no, then the court will appoint somebody. Mm -hmm. And that you never want to happen. Because it's going Did to be... Out the ones that didn't want to go to no, somebody. he cannot appoint if everybody said no. Okay. So they're out. They're clear. But what would happen is, is they may, if it was, say, y'all, say it was your mother. Okay? And Steph is your brother, and Travis is the grandson. You said no, Stefan said no, Travis says no. Well, they might call up Leela and say, hey, Leela, you're our go-to for all the other ones, so here you go. You're gonna you're gonna serve for free. What do you think she's gonna end up? Do you think that she is going to go over and do a wonderful job and be in detail? Well, she don't have to. She's no, 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 she's gonna do the bare minimum. She did the bare minimum. She's gonna do the very the very bottom of the deal because she ain't getting paid. Right. Nobody would do it by maximum if they're not getting paid. Okay. So again, this is one of those situations that you gotta make certain that as you're dealing with this, you understand this breakdown. Now, let's put a little spin on this. Okay. This is a normal trust process. Now, do y'all remember in finance we talked about a deed in trust? Okay, it's not really a trust. A deed in trust is not a trust. A deed in trust is a financial document. However, it still uses the same concept. So who do you think of these three, Mr. Eugene, is the borrower? Who do you think is going to be the borrower? The trustor, trustee, or beneficiary? Trustor. Trustor. That's correct. Because the borrower is borrowing money. If I'm a borrower and Travis is the bank, I'm borrowing money from Travis. And if I don't pay you back, Travis, do you want your deed back? Heck yeah, yeah. he wants his deed. So he's having me go ahead and create this trust. That if I don't pay, guess what he can do? He can force the sale and get his deed back. Okay? So he, if I'm the borrower, I'm the trustor. I'm the one creating the trust for whose benefit? Travis. So that puts you as what, Travis, up here? Nope. Oh, the beneficiary. Because of the fact of the matter is, if I don't pay, who gets it? Travis. Therefore, it benefits who? Travis. Okay? So then who the heck's going to be the trustee? Yes. Yeah, well, come back to it. It's an attorney. Oh, yeah. And oftentimes, whose attorney? Is it going to be my attorney? Or oh, is it going to be Travis's oh, attorney? Huh? You know what he is. Why is it going to be Travis's? Because he's the one watching out for his money. Oh, but Travis, my attorney, Stefan, would do a great job. That's not nice. I got my own. But, but Stefan. No, yeah, I understand. I got a guy. But Stefan. That's not good. I got to go. Well, Stephen, he don't want you, man. Sorry. So, yeah, of course. Question. Was, what was that? I have a question. Yes, um, can you, you can't be a, a, a trustor, uh, sorry, a uh, trustee. Well, one of them. And, a, <laughs> and, a, and wow. the beneficiary at the same time. That is correct. Yes. The trustee has to be a neutral third party. So, you cannot be, just like in the same situation, this happens, this is what happens in the IRS. See, and, and you can't do this, okay? But say, for example, Miss Leela, that you happen to make a lot of money in counseling this year, and you got it all basically in cash and check, and you got it all in your bank, and you're like, I don't want to report this this year. I don't <laughs> want to report anything. So 
Leela goes and creates a trust. Okay, so she's the trustor. And she ends up, she puts all of her money that she made in counseling. She made over $5 million this past year. Oh, and wow. She put it all into, oh, yeah, counseling's a good field. She put it all into the trust. Okay. And then what she ends up doing is she puts her husband as the trustee or her best friend. And then guess who happens to be the beneficiary? Her. So what ends up happening, what, what is that? Is she still, the question the IRS had was, is she still in control of the money? No. Yes, she no. is. Yes, she <laughs> is. Because what happens when you put your friend or you put your loved one in there as trustee? You still control them. Because you're, think about this. If I told, if I put Travis in that same hypothetical as my trustee, and I'm his employer, but actually I'm paying him a very large amount of money every month. And I tell him, hey, Travis, give me some money out of my trust. He ain't going to tell me no. Because if he does, what happens? He ain't going to make good money. He ain't going to make good money no more. Okay? So that's another way people will use trust to try to work the system. But it don't work. It's a waste of your time. You might as well not even do that. But again, this shows you that breakdown of how this is supposed to work. Okay? Now, of course, there can be a living trust. So the difference between this trust and this trust is that keyword right there, Stephen. What's that word say right there, sir? Living. So living, does that mean you're dead? No. No. So it means you're alive, right? So in this trust, it often happens to this situation. It's the trustors creating something for the benefit of somebody after they die most of the time okay a living trust is what i was kind of talking about with miss leela she ends up she's to provide financial care during a trustor's lifetime now if leela sets it up properly and is not trying to do tax evasion or any of that other crazy stuff then miss leela in this particular situation guess what happens Miss Leela could end up, she could set up a living trust and it pays her and she ends up getting over. Okay. The problem is, is this, is how it's set up right here. Is it going to be a revocable or irrevocable living trust? If it is revocable, all monies within that account can be taken or taxed if it's revocable. Because Miss Leela could just one day say, you know, I don't want all my money. Give it all to me. So you can take it all. But in an irrevocable, guess what happens? It's stuck. It's just like a business. That money is stuck in there and it will not be dispersed. It has to follow the instructions. So again, you gotta be very careful when you're dealing with these different trusts that you set it up properly, okay? Now, a revocable living trust basically is a will substitute, okay? It avoids probate. It can be changed or revoked at any time, and the trustor in this hypothetical can be the trustee and beneficiary. Because the whole thing comes back to what? It's what? It's revocable. So it's basically like you going to take some money and put it down in my bank account. Okay, yeah, I put it in the trust name, but ultimately, I'm still making the benefit out of it. I'm making the rules. So from the IRS standpoint, what is it? Even though it's classified as a trust, it's really what? Bank account. It's a bank account. Okay. You can name beneficiaries upon the death of that trustor. Guess what? Can't you do that with the checking or savings account? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The trust is reported as a, on the individual tax return because, again, it's your money. And the homestead protection preserved on the transfer into a revocable living trust. Sometimes what people will do is Mr. Eugene, you may have your house paid off and you want to go ahead and create this living trust and put all your assets that you own into this trust. And you don't want your children to have to worry about probate after you die. So your children, you put everything in there for your children. And when you pass away, instead of going through the whole pro process of probate, 
then whoever you named as a beneficiary takes over possession. So, and that's not just your checking account, it's everything. That's right, it goes to the next person. But what happens at that point is that being a revocable trust could do what? Well, you may put everything in it and then tomorrow I'll say, yeah, screw everything, I want it all out back in my name again. Okay? Or you may take it and try to do a tax shelter and put everything into it to avoid taxes, or maybe put it in there so, you know, you owe uh, Stefan this time, you owe Stefan some money, and Stefan's now fixing to follow judgment against you, and guess what, guess what uh, you do? Oh, crap, he's about to do this, so I'm going to take everything out of my name and put it in this trust. Yeah, there we go. Then Stefan can't get nothing. Sorry about this, Stephen. Okay, well, oh, well wait, much money. guess what, Mr. Eugene, here's your problem. You put it in a revocable trust. Well, I'll put it in there. That's different. We'll talk about that. Right. But you put it in a revocable trust. Uh -oh. What are you going to do, Stephen? <laughs> he's going to go still file the paperwork. Oh, that's what gonna do. And he's going to say, Your Honor, Travis, uh, by the way, I was suing him for $10,000. And uh, just want to let you know, by the way, he also went out and created a trust and threw everything in just before I filed this to avoid you uh, allowing to take possession from him. So. Uh, all of his assets have been put in a trust, and he just did this two days before I filed. So I just want to let you know. What are you going to do? Oh, that's okay. <laughs> no. No. Oh, sounds good. Then. I'll take no, it. No, here's what's going to happen is I'll he's going to say, you're trying to commit fraud. So not only is this a civil matter, but guess what? Now it's a criminal matter, too. Okay? And they will breach that trust. Okay? So, again, you can't do that. Now, an irrevocable trust is completely different. This one has a lot of power, a lot of power. But you as an individual, guess what? Lost all that power, okay? So it cannot be amended or revoked once it's been executed. The minute that you put it in there, Mr. Eugene, all that stuff, whatever you put in your instructions, that's it. That's it, okay? You cannot go back and amend it and you can't revoke it, okay? The assets are permanently removed from the grantor's estate, and they are transferred to the trust. So that means all of that is permanently in that trust, right? And you have to file a separate trust tax return, which must pay taxes at the higher trust tax rate, okay? But here's the reason why. You are able to now shield your assets from anything else. See, there are, there are very wealthy people, very wealthy people that put all of their stuff in the trust because they have no intentions of selling their house. They have no intentions of selling their assets. They have a ton of money and they don't want somebody suing them directly and getting any of those assets. So they will borrow the car, they'll live in the trust house, we'll do all of that normal stuff, but it's all in a trust. But the thing is, is what is their net worth? Individually, they are zero assets. The trust is what? They have all the assets, okay? Now, Mr. Eugene, if you happen to get in a car accident and hit Stefan, and Stefan sues you and gets a judgment against you, what do you have? Nothing. Nothing. What can you collect from? Nothing. Nothing. Because he put it in a irrevocable trust. Now that's only if he did this well in advance. Now if he did this the day before and then gets in a car accident, there could be a chance. But if it ended up, if this actually ended up happening years ago, and you get in a car accident, you have nothing, Stephen ain't getting cracked. It's a problem. I like that, Stephen. Uh, get screwed, I'm right? I'll take this license. Yeah. Now, a testamentary trust, it provides financial care to the beneficiary after the trustor's death. So what this happens is, is you can create a testamentary trust, and this is oftentimes within a wheel that creates a financial plan for the for that. So, Mr. Eugene, you may not create a trust, 
in regards, if you have a little Justin, a little April, okay, you might have not ended up created a trust trust, but you might have created a trust that all your monies go into a trust that Miss Leela is going to manage and pay for, but that only happens at the time you die. So this trust is only created when you die. Okay. There's also what we call land trust, and these provide a non a, a non amenity for the beneficiary. Okay. The real estate is the only asset. The beneficiary retains management and control of the property through the trustee. It's generally for a very definite term, and it's normally for what they call speculative holding purposes. You will see land trust when it comes down to they're trying to make purchases and they don't want people to know. So say a large college wants to buy some property, but they don't want Travis to know Say Texas A&E, you know, Travis has 100 acres in call it Chase. And Travis ends up, he's put it up for sale. Well, Stefan is representing Texas A&M. Now, Travis, if Stefan submits you an offer with Texas A&M in the buyer's comment, <clears throat> are you going to be like, yeah, I'll take the lowest price? What you going to say? They got way more money than that. So. Yeah, uh, my price that I wasn't listed now just doubled. Yeah. Okay. But if you get a contract that shows TBC uh, land trust or something, I'm just making a name up. What are you going to think? Yeah. Some mom and pop yeah, buying my property yeah. and you negotiate. Okay. But again, in that situation, what's really happening? <coughs> Travis is basically in that particular situation is he doesn't know. So they hide this stuff where people don't know where the offers are coming in. It's kind of like a little disguise. Can you uh, pause the deal for me? Give me just a second. So again, like I said, is this is just one method, okay? It's just one method in regards to this particular situation where you can end up, you can submit offers without basically telling them who you are. You know, Travis may be a known agent that buys up land. Well, if it gets around town that Travis is buying up a bunch of land, well, people are going to be has a lot of money, and they're going to end up instantaneously not take anything what? Lower than list, because they know he has it. Okay? So it's a way to shield your protection. <coughs> now, this is my favorite part, okay? Because I love talking business. All right, I've dealt with all of these. I teach this all the time. I love business. And if you've already taken any business law courses in your entire life, this is going to be a refresher. Okay. But this applies to both real estate companies and also, uh, and also just an individual that just starts a business. Okay. So the types of ownership in business basically is you could have a sole proprietor. You could be a business organization. You could be a partnership, corporation, limited liability, or syndicate. Okay. Now, a sole proprietor is what 90%, I would say, would you agree with that, Travis, that nine, about 90% of all small businesses are sole proprietor, or at least start off as a sole proprietor? Yeah. Because most of the time, if you start a business, doesn't matter if it's real estate or Mr. Eugene, you want to do machining or whatever. It comes down to the whole situation is, is you're the normal, the only one started. Just like when I first started my real estate company, it was just JS Nobles and Associates and we were a DBA. I think even McDonald's started off as a sole proprietor. Yep, most big companies always start off as a sole proprietor because of the fact is, is if you're a single company, a single individual, and you're starting a business from scratch, do you have a lot of money? Not really, most small businesses don't. Most people start off, say Mr. Eugene, you decide, you know what, I'm going to start my own machine board, my own machine companies. And I'm going to start that up. You may not have but $20 to your name. Okay? Are you going to go out and hire attorneys and draft contracts? And, no, you ain't got the money. You ain't got the cash. So what happens is, is it's a single individual, and I also tell people, this is kind of that trial. I always say this is like the 30-day free trial. Okay? Sometimes that 30 days turns into like five years or even longer for some people. But a sole proprietor is a single individual that operates a business. 
They own all the assets. They also assume all liabilities and assume all risk. So a creditor in this ownership could go after your personal assets because it's like Eugene's machine company. Okay. Well, you, you make all the choices, Mr. Eugene, but guess what? You get all the, the headaches, the liability, something goes wrong, you get sued, it's all on you. So when you make money, while you may have created a DBA checking account with Eugene Machine Company, it's still in your name, still your personal asset, okay? So in that particular situation is, this works for individuals that they're just trial and error. Maybe, maybe Travis has hired you to do a side hustle for him, you know, making certain little things for his real estate clients. Well, you may be making little like, like say cutouts of houses and you're writing their names into it or something. That's what you're doing. Well, in that situation is you and Travis, if you are best friends, what's the chances of Travis really suing you? Probably slim. Yeah. Your friends, slim. Okay. But if you bring in, say, Miss uh, Mr. Keith, <coughs> who you've never met from Adam, he actually found out about you through Travis, and now Mr. Keith wants to hire you, and he wants a hundred of them a month because he's closing so many houses. Well, do you think you should still be running as a sole proprietor? No, no, because if you screw up Mr. Keith's stuff, what's he probably going to do? Sue you? He's going to sue you. Okay. So in that situation is, and if he sues you. If your assets of your so-called quote unquote business are not enough, he's going after your personal assets next. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, the profit and loss reported on the personal income tax. Okay. In this particular situation, your profits and losses are not going to be separate. It's going to be on your income tax, your own personal income tax. Frequently, these are used in real estate brokers. A lot of new real estate brokers, and I was one of them when I first started out, I was a sole proprietor. I just ended up, I just was J.S. Nobles and Associates. And I had two, three agents underneath me, and that was it. And the three that were underneath me were friends of mine. But we only did maybe a handful of transactions our first year. The next year, we grew ex basically through the roof, okay? We went from, I believe, three agents to 30 agents in one year. That's a lot, okay? And we had a lot of transactions going. Well, when you get a lot of transactions, what happens? The more transactions, and we'll just put it this way. When I say more transactions, it's basically the same thing as more money, more what? More problem, right? More money, more problem. Right, Stephanie? <laughs> you know what I'm saying. So the more money, the more problem. The more sales you do, the more chances that you're going to get sued. All right? Do I want to be sued as a sole proprietor? Heck no. no. Last thing I want to be is sued, because if my company doesn't have the assets to cover it, then what are they coming after? Personal. They're coming after my personal stuff. Everybody, if I have a house, a car, or any of that, they're taking all that stuff. Okay? So, yeah, you'd be homeless. Well, I was thinking sleeping on Miss Leela's uh, on, her, on her rug in her front door. That's what I was thinking if I, if I lost it. You know, I was thinking you're a realtor, so you can find a place. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, I mean, you go in that situation, you know, you end up, you, you just kind of go in here and you're, you're, it's good in the beginning. Or if you only do very few transactions, you know. There are many different companies, even in counseling. There are some people that they're a counselor. They only take in five or 10 clients and that's it. That's all they want. But the people they take in, they're not friends, but they're, they're basically been together long enough over the years that there's a good relationship there. So the chances of being sued may be pretty slim. Okay. But you only want to use a sole proprietor if you're starting out your business and you're not doing anything that's high, high risk. If that makes sense. You're not going to be mowing yards. If Stefan says, I'm going to start mowing the mowing fruit, I'm going to mow people's yards. Pretty slim if he's just mowing small little lots. Now, if he's doing something major, what could end up happening? 
Well, if he's doing, you know, he's mowing on construction on the, the highway, what could end up happening? Yeah, it could be more wind chills. You could call somebody to get, get killed. There could be a lot of different things that could end up happening in that particular situation. So again, you have to be very, very careful in regards to how you're handling these different situations. Now, understand also that if you're going to be using a sole proprietor, understand that what happens is, is you're going to file what's called an assumed name certificate with the county clerk, okay? So in this particular situation, you would have to file a DBA, all right? And that's what most people do. You're not gonna go out and say, Eugene's, you know, manufacturing company. You're not gonna do that. You're gonna go out and you're gonna end up saying what? Well, I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm gonna go through here, I'm gonna look at my different options and all of that and go from there. Hold on just a second. Um, then also in the same situation is that the registration also with the Secretary of State, however, is not required. So if, if for example, Mr. Eugene, you want to start Eugene's manufacturing or uh, machining company, all you got to do is go down to your local county, file a one or two page piece of paper and say, hey, I'm known as Eugene's machine company. So if anything happens, a lawsuit gets filed, here's my information. Does that make sense? But you do not have to file it at the Secretary of State. Now, if you're going to do business, however, say in Harris County, guess what you got to go do? You got to go to that county and file a DBA. So any county that you're going to market or work in, you got to file a DBA. Okay. Now, a partnership is a different type. This is the next type. So this is that situation. Say, Mr. Eugene, you started your, your little machining company. And all of a sudden, now you're getting a lot of sales. Okay, you're getting a lot of business. So now you end up, say that Mr. Garrett contacts you and says, hey, I've always wanted to do what you do. Can I come work with you? And you say, yeah, 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 come on and work. I need, to, I need another helper. I got a lot of work. I want you to be there. So then what ends up happening is, is Mr. Garrett goes over and y'all now together decide, you know what, we're not going to be a sole proprietor anymore. We're going to be a partnership, okay? And in that particular situation, it's where two or more people operate as co-owners, okay? Again, there's a share in the business profits and losses, and the agreement can be either oral or written. But which way do you think is the best option? It's being right. It's being right. Because you need to know how we're going to share these profits. If everything's oral, what happens? Yeah. Garrett, you first say, hey, 50 50. Uh -huh. Okay, we're going to split everything 50 50. Yeah, then Garrett goes over, and, and after y'all make a big transaction, he says, oh, you said I get 80. Whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah, now you got a problem. Yeah. Okay, again, the title may be in individual names. It could be Nobles and Morrison. Okay, it may be, you know, uh, Nobles and Grossman. It could be a lot of different things. Okay. Or y'all could just create a partnership name, okay? So in that situation, you may create a partnership. If you do that, then what is this called again, Mr. Eugene? Ownership in several teams. And how many owners? One. There's one, okay? So the partnership could be in individual names, or y'all could just make a partnership name, okay? But again, in this situation, is this is a different method, okay? a different option that you could run. Now, general partnership is where all partners are going to participate in the management to some extent. So the difference between just a partnership, this is something that's very basic, you know, just friends working together. And I don't recommend this, by the way. If you're going to do this, you need to have an attorney and y'all need to sit down and think of every single issue that could possibly arise and have it right, okay? Because normally one of the biggest headaches comes from this right here. Okay. Now a general partnership, it's a little bit more interesting. It's where all partners are going to participate in management to some extent. Each partner personally is responsible for all business losses and obligations. So that's called joint and several liability. 
okay? They do require that you have to file an assumed name certificate. And it's not, however, required to register with the Secretary of State. Okay, it's not required. Now, in a limited partnership, a limited partnership is where both the general and limited partners are going to be involved. Now, in a limited partnership, the general partner runs the business. So, Mr. Eugene, if, if you want it, say that Garrett, you know, he actually, he doesn't want to be involved in the business, and, and Stefan doesn't want to be involved in the business. They just want to put money into it to get a profit. Well, you would still be the general partner. You run the business, okay? Now, of course, you're going to be personally responsible for all business losses or obligations, okay? So because of that situation, you are going to be personally responsible because it's your business, all right? Now, a limited partner, however, would be Garrett and Stephanie. And that's where the limited partner's liability is going to be limited to the extent of their investment. So if, for example, Garrett and Stefan both put in, say, $50,000 into your business, well, they are only liable up to $50,000. So if a lawsuit occurred and it's $100,000, okay, now if there's three of you, it's going to be split amongst you three. But if it's at any point, it's over $50,000 for them, they can't be sued. So they are only sued up to the extent of their investment. Okay, but understand, it's also divided by how many members. So if it's 100,000 and there's three, well, that's three, you split it across, it's still under that 50,000 threshold. But if there's only one partner and one limited person, and it's $100,000, well, guess what? They've already capped it to 50,000, they have to pay it, okay? Now it is very popular among real estate investors. Real estate investors can love this one. Uh, so real estate investors like this because what happens is, is there's normally one person that runs it and operates it and people just put money into it. So Miss Leela may be an active person that's going in doing all the stuff, but in the situation is, is that Stefan, myself, and you may want to put money into it so we can make some cash, okay? But however much money we put in, Guess what happens? We can be sued up to. That makes sense. Now, this, of course, is going to be registered. Um, you are have to register this business, though, with the Secretary of State. Okay. Now, this is a little different. LLP is a limited liability partnership. Okay. And it's managed like a general partnership. However, no partner is personally liable for any obligation of the LLP unless the obligation relates to an action or omission or it arises under a contract or commitment that's entered into while the partnership is an LLP. So it's required to register the business with the Secretary of State. Now, Mr. Eugene, what's a corporation? A very big business, okay? Not all, let me rephrase that, not always a big business. It's, it mainly comes into, most of the time, yes, when people think of corporations are very big. But you sometimes can have a pretty small corporation, okay? You may happen to just have a lot of money, and a lot of people, you've made a lot of money, you've maybe made it rich off of something, and you just happen to want to have a corporation where people can buy into your deal or you might want to sell, sell on the New York Stock Exchange. So you may need a certain type. Well, a corporation does that. So it doesn't always have to be like, you know, J.C. Penney's or uh, Macy's or any of those. It doesn't have to be that big. It could be something that, Mr. Eugene, your business started off as a sole proprietor, your little old business, and now it's a corporation because you got so much work. Okay? doesn't mean that it's got to end up being massive. Okay, it could be something as small and, and simple, it does not have to be huge. Okay, so it's an artificial person. Okay, and what that basically means is, is I could turn my company, Nobles Realty Group, into a corporation. It actually technically already is because it's a limited liability corporation. But I could turn it into a full-blown C-Corp, is what they call it. And in that situation is, it is its own person. 
It is its own individual. So an artificial person means that it has the same rights as you and me. Okay. So again, it's going to be owned when you purchase things owned in severalty, which is the corporation's name, not me individually. Okay. Now, again, it's going to exist in perpetuity. And what that means is that it continues and continues and continues until basically somebody dissolves it. Okay. So it never ends. So when you hear perpetuity, it just means it continues until something happens, until y'all dissolve it. Now, they do require a corporate charter that sets forth the powers of the corporation because corporate corporation has to know what to do. It's like a baby, okay? The only thing is, is the people that have ownership in the corporation is the corporation's brain. So the members or owners, board of directors is what they're normally called, if we're the board of directors and it's us three, then we, um, us three, are telling the corporation what to do. We're the brain, basically, of the matter. Does that make sense? So our thoughts tells the corporation what to do, which makes it in that situation, the charter sets forth what we allow that corporation to do. Okay. Now, a corporate resolution authorizes the sale of corporate real estate. If we all agree that we want to sell off some of the property, well, we do a corporate resolution. Again, corporations are managed and operated by a board of directors, okay? And a lot of times this can be paid or unpaid, it just depends. Again, it comes back to what's the charter say? Are these people serving a certain term? Do they get compensated? Do they not get compensated? What are their duties? What are their powers? All of that stipulated within the powers that are given by the board. Now, what can happen is us three could end up being the board of directors and say that Mr. Keith wants to buy into our deal. He thinks we, we've got something. Well, we can allow him to purchase stock in our company, which allows him to put money into our business for him to have a percentage of ownership in that business. Okay. So th they can be owned by stockholders or it is owned by stockholders, which is personal property. And the stockholder li liability is limited to the amount of their investment. So again, if Keith puts in, say, $10,000 into our company, well, he's only limited to $10,000. Okay. Uh, again, you have to register with the state uh, Secretary of State. The primary disadvantage to a corporation is this one right here. What's that say, Mr. Eugene? Double taxation. What's that mean? That means you'll get double. You'll get double the taxation. Yeah. You'll assume. Yeah, so Mr. Eugene, we're continuing with your, your hypothetical about your machine company, okay? So you've ended up in this particular situation. You have this machining company, and as you're going through this, you got this company that you're running, and we've now turned it into a corporation. And so now it's you, me, and Stefan, all right? And what ends up happening is, is as people buy stuff, they're going to write the check in whose name? In your name? No, the corporation. And the corporation. So the corporation gets the money. Okay. Well, because the corporation is a person, mm -hmm. it's got to get what? It's got to get taxed. So since this corporation is a person, it's got to get taxed. So when the money comes in, you got to pay taxes. Well, then when you decide, okay, well, I need to pay myself my salary, mm -hmm. what do you get to do, Mr. Oh, Eugene? Get you get to pay taxes. So the money that came in gets taxed, and then when they pay it out to their owners, it gets taxed again. Okay, that's double taxation. Now, what happened was, well, so many people were so sick and tired of that, that they created this S corporation. And what it did, look at that very first line there, Mr. Eugene, what's that say? It avoids the double taxation. It avoids it, okay? And it's treated as a partnership for tax purposes. So the profits and losses are passed to each stockholder for individual taxation. So the profits, instead of getting taxed, are going, instead of taxed at corporate, come down to the individual level. Okay. And the shareholders, however, look at this. They put a limit on it. Can't have no more than 75. Ain't that sweet? 75, you cannot have more shareholders than 75. 
If you do, guess what ends up happening? You got to go switch over to a C port, which you get to do what? Go get double taxed. Okay. The, the disadvantage of this type of corporation is that it's limited pass through of your losses. And there's a limited amount. Now, this is what I have. This is what I have. Call it limited liability corporation. Best thing you could have ever made to slice bread. It's a pass through tax advantages of a partnership. It is a limited liability, though, of a corporation, which means I get the advantages, the tax advantages of a partnership, but guess what also happens? I also get that shielding of liability that a corporation offers. So I'm getting both. I can also have members and managers. We avoid liabilities for the company debts, obligations, and liabilities. Personal property interest can also be involved, and I could create a series LLC. However, I don't recommend that. You get into a series LLC, you're just creating a nightmare for yourself. Okay? Don't get in a series LLC. It's best to separate them out. Unless your attorney advises differently, don't recommend it. It's best to have different entities. Now, a syndicate is where there are two or more people joined to make a real estate investment. So we may not create a full-blown company. We just make two or more of us decide, hey, we're going to go in and buy some real estate. And because of that, we're going to go in and do this. And that's going to end up in that particular situation that creates this syndicate. Now, a real estate brokerage can be a business entity, okay? Just like we talked about the different types, a business, except for a sole proprietor, must, number one, have a designated managing officer to act for it, which means there has to be somebody that is actually going to be responsible for that business, okay? And what happens is that person also has to have a broker's license, okay? So not only do they have to be designated, but they also have to have a broker's license. The designated managing officer must be an active licensed broker in good standing. Okay. Now, there is a business franchise tax in Texas, and it applies to entities with liability protection. You are a liability entity. And if you are a business with 1 million or less in total revenue, that's for the year, you don't have to worry about it. But if you bring in more than a million a year, you get a franchise tax. Okay. Now, cooperative is where title is going to be helped by the cooperative. This is where we're talking about, we keep going and I'll come back. It's where the purchaser is a shareholder with a stock certificate. They do have a what's called proprietary lease and the personal property interest, not in real estate, though. So if, Mr. Eugene, you purchase, a, say, a cooperative, interest in a cooperative, you don't actually own the property. They basically say, here you go, Mr. Eugene, here's you, your ownership, some paper. Okay. So you, got, you have interest in our business, you got a stock certificate, and you have a right to a lease, but you don't own any of the stuff, none at all, Zip it. okay? You just have interest in our business, okay? The disadvantage is that there is the possibility of default due to unpaid monthly assessments. You don't pay your assessments, you default. And a cooperative may profit on a resale, so they can actually profit off of your deal. They may want you to default so they can profit, okay? Now, a condominium is a little bit different. This is that condo. And it is oftentimes you get fee simple ownership of that unit. So it's a tenant in common ownership of the common elements. So like where the swimming pool is or any of those things, that's going to be common areas which everybody has common ownership. Now, it is limited common elements such as bearing walls and stairs. The general common elements, of course, will be the land, the roof, and the pool, and there can be an HOA. Most likely there is. Ownership of land, 
The difference is, is in a condominium, you don't have ownership. So in a condominium, you don't own the land. You have no interest. You normally, like I tell people all the time, is Mr. Eugene, you own these four walls. Everything inside the four walls, you own. But you don't own anything else, okay? You own the stuff within these four walls. In a townhome, though, you get to own the land on which you're in, okay? So you actually have the ownership of the land underneath. The creation is that condominium declaration and reg uh, regimen plan or plat. It's going to be recorded with the county clerk. Okay. The declaration, which is going to be the rights and obligation of each owner, as well as the plat. The plat is going to subdivide the land and building into different units. Each unit owner would own the carpet to the ceiling and the paint to the paint. Again, the operation administration is that the it's going to be administered by the owner's association. That's going to be your HOA. And then it's going to be according to the bylaws in that particular declaration. So the association is going to act through the board of directors and the assessments are going to be paid to pay taxes, insurance and maintenance, as well as the common elements that are also stated. The operation and administration Further, it's going to be continued that individuals will have to pay taxes, insurance, and maintenance on individual units, and the assessments may be foreclosable against that homestead. Sometimes that can occur. When there is a termination, there must be all unit owners have to agree. And the revocation agreement is going to be recorded with the county clerk. Each unit owners are going to become the tenants in common, and each is going to own an undivided interest in the entire property, which equals a percentage ownership in the common elements that were held previously. So again, this kind of gives you an example, Mr. Eugene. So the owner of unit four would own his or her unit. So you see four is all great there plus a undivided one-fifth share of the elevator, lobby, grounds, and structure. Because look how many owners there are. There are five. Because of that, it means one-fifth. Okay. Now, in a timeshare ownership, if you've ever been through a timeshare, not something I recommend, okay, unless you know what you're doing. But it is where multiple owners with undivided interest in one piece of real estate, okay, uh, the timeshare estate would be fee simple, and the timeshare use is a license, permission to be on the property. The vacation ownership interest, as well as the vacation ownership plans, are other options. I'm going to tell you, and I highly recommend that you understand this, that you in no shape or form ever, ever sign a timeshare ownership agreement unless you have consulted with legal counsel and not their legal counsel, okay? You look out for your interest because I guarantee you, they are not looking out for your interest. People think, well, you know, Mr. Grossman, he's the attorney for the timeshare. He's not gonna lie to me. Yeah, Mr. Grossman's getting his paycheck for me. Who's he gonna look out for? They gonna look out for me. He ain't looking out for nobody else, okay? So you need to have, before you sign anything, even if, it, even if it's a high sales pitch, you better make certain. I remember my dad and mom, when we went on vacation sometimes, it'd be those timeshare people would be like, come in for a, for a quick little meeting with us. Yeah, they just want to lock you in and get your money, okay? And I'm not saying all timeshares are bad. I'm just saying you need to know before you jump into them because they can lock you in for a very, very long time. Again, timeshare projects must be registered with TREC, and the selling agent actually has to have a real estate license. You actually have to have a real estate license. Then for the prospective purchaser must be given a timeshare disclosure statement. The purchaser may con or cancel the contract before the sixth day after signing or receiving that disclosure. There are restrictions on the developer's receipts of funds after closing. Okay. All right. So that right there ends our chapter 11. Guess what? We only have one more chapter to go for this course. Okay. 
So Mr. Grossman, could you go ahead and stop our recording?